I just want to share a personal moment. Uh, our new brother Ashton had this wonderful moment during that song where he like comfortably walked up to the communion rail and then over to see his family. And it was just absolutely beautiful to um, witness the way that children understand that like this is their church home and that they need to be comfortable here. So props to you, young man. Um, our sermon today, jumping into business here, um, our sermon for today is the next set of verses in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we have been in for the last couple weeks. I preach on the lectionary, right? Those are ascribed texts of the church. And that means that they kind of cycle in a particular order. They follow the liturgical seasons. They, they follow the rhythm of the church. And so it's natural that we've kind of stepped from one piece to the next in, this, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount today, Jesus is commenting on some of the law. We talked about law before, right? He's commenting on some of the law from the Old Testament um, and kind of saying, yes, this is the law and also here's how we should see it. And the thing about what Jesus is talking about today is he is touching on some of the most contentious and divided issues of his day. Um, so it's guaranteed to make us uncomfortable. Let's go ahead and listen. As I said to Winter earlier, this is hard to read. So. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with your brother or your sister, you are you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to counsel. And if you say, you fool, you, when you are, I'm sorry, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you offer your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, first to reconcile to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it is said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye has causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So um, there, are, there are questions that I hate answering as a pastor. Uh, questions that I know will probably get me into trouble. Because they're questions where no one ever really agrees on the answer, where they're just kind of known, divided ideas. Hey, Pastor Winter, what's your stance on abortion? Pastor Winter, how do you feel about curse words? Pastor Winter, what does the ideal Christian marriage look like? Sigh. Usually if I'm caught off guard, my first reaction is a very physical one where my heart begins to beat quickly. And I hear a voice in my head that says, well, Winter, you're the one who always likes to deal with difficult texts. You're the one who has a passion for building bridges, right? You brought this upon yourself. And I find myself standing there 
wondering if my answer is gonna be another plank in that bridge that we're building or the match that burns it. And then I just get that overwhelming sensation that I am a, I am gonna offend at least one person, probably in the next minute. I think that this is, uh, this is true for most religious leaders. People like to ask religious leaders these really difficult questions, um, and it's kind of our job as religious leaders to challenge people as well as to figure out how to love them really well. Um, it was true for the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the time of Jesus. It's still true for the Catholic priest that hangs out in the pub at the Central West End, the Episcopalian priest that went to that meeting about helping immigrants, the Presbyterian lay person doing pulpit supply. Contentious questions get asked to religious leaders all of the time. And in today's political climate, they kind of just get asked of most of us. And it's uncomfortable, right? You're just sitting there and someone brings up one of those questions and you don't want to harm, but you also want to be authentic, right? And sometimes people, sometimes people, Christians and non-Christians alike, they use these kind of questions as like a litmus test for your faith. Like, are you really a Christian? Let me ask you this question. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. I don't often use the word hate. I really hate it because it seems to lead down to this path of not really helping anything, <laughs> right? Just, it's like someone's trying to set you up. Um, or, or that like if we don't have this one thing in common, then there's no way that we can hold Christ in common or anything else for that matter. It leaves me at the corner of not finding an agreement and uh, saying things like, it's not a dichotomy, and where's the closest door so I can leave? When I was, um, when I was thinking about how to approach this text today, there was a few different ways that I know that um, I could have gone about it. And uh, at first I thought I would go through all of Jesus' answers to to these hot topic questions, right? Um, and that I could explain kind of what was happening in that time period and about how the Allah used to make sense and then how Jesus was reinterpreting it. And then we could attempt to find some like common ethic, considering that like the three contentious issues that we heard are all still contentious issues, right? Um, so I was, I was gonna do that, but I, I don't think that, uh, that that's really helpful, actually. If you want to know, if you want to know about the definitions of what adultery meant in like, you know, uh, 1000 BCE and in the time of Jesus versus now, shoot me an email and we can have that conversation at a different time. But um, we're not going to do that today. Because the truth is, even if I tried to glean the perfect answer or the perfect ethic to share with you all, we are not going to agree on those ethics. We're not going to agree on those answers. So again, if you're interested, shoot me an email. So instead of doing that, we're going to take a step back from the nitty gritty details of this text and try to observe it from a distance. And from a distance, we can see that these topics, each of these topics, have to do with broken relationship. And not like surface level relationships, but the deep ones, the really, really close ones, the people that can, can hurt you with just a glance. What did the law of God say about how we deal with deeply broken personal relationships? And how would Jesus interpret those laws? These laws, these ones that were the most contentious are so because they are the closest to people's hearts so for the last two weeks and this week, we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount and we've been looking at some words from the prophets and there's some common themes that we've heard. We've heard a lot about the law. We've heard a lot about the fulfillment of the words of the prophets. We've heard um, about relationship. We've heard about the kingdom of God. And we've heard about worship. We've heard quite a bit about worship actually. And last week while I was talking to you all in a flu-riddled state, <laughs> Um, I was talking about worship 
as the way to restoration and reconciliation in our world. And we're going to do a short refresher um, of some of the words we were talking about, um, just, just, just so I'm sure that we're all kind of there. So let's put the first slide up. The first word is ordo. Say ordo. Ordo. Excellent. It means order. It's like an order of worship, how we come in, we welcome, we sing in praise, we pray, we do baptisms. It's our ordo. Um, and it relates very much so to the next word. Say liturgy. Liturgy. That means the work of the people. And so when we're in worship together, we are all worshiping God. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard said that we have a false idea um, often about worship. We assume that when we come to worship, that if we're sitting in the pews, it's like we're at a theater and we are the audience. And then like the pastors and the musicians are like, um, are like the people that are uh, giving um, kind, of, kind of there to be observed and to be viewed. But, but really, um, we're all participants. We're all participants, not just the people up here. And the audience is God. Okay. So when we do liturgy, the work of the people is all of us. And we use this word liturgical for a lot of things, like depending on the season, we have a liturgical color that hangs that tells you about that. Or how I preach on the Revised Common Lectionary that follows the liturgical calendar, which is why it, even when I don't have a sermon series, my sermons kind of bump up against each other because they naturally flow one into the other. Okay, and the idea is that this liturgical flow, this ordo, can speak not just here in worship, but outside of the walls of worship as well. So how does this relate? Okay. In our text today, Jesus said, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, first to be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. The text says if, uh, says when. It doesn't say if. It doesn't say if you have problems with your brother or sister. It doesn't say if. It says when. This is inevitable. When you have issues with one another, when you have these points of contention, Jesus pulls in worship practices. At first, it kind of sounds like he says, stop in the middle of your worship and go take care of it and then come back to worship. But I think a better way to think of this is, is to perhaps consider that it's the act of worship itself that assists in the reconciliation of peoples and the world. In fact, this reconciliation kind of take, takes place in the midst of worship. So what I'm suggesting here has everything to do that when, when we are in the space of dealing with the difficult rules or the contentious topics, that we do in fact turn our hearts and our minds back to a state of worship. The order of what Jesus said, he says, it's, it's come to the altar to leave your gift, go be reconciled, then come back and give your gift. That sounds a little bit like communion. You know, when we take communion, like Eucharist, right? It's, it's well to remember, it, it might help us to have a little context here, that when Jesus was talking about this altar and this gift and this sacrifice, um, what they were probably talking about was an animal sacrifice. So what you would do is you would bring a gift to the temple. There was just one temple. And there was an order of priests that would take that animal from you. And they would perform the ritual, which we would think probably is very gruesome and offer, like, used blood and stuff. But, but pretty much what, afterwards, they would cook the meat for you as the burnt offering. And you would show up a little later and they'd give you, like, your, hand, your, like, uh, your lamb or your roast beef back. They were like, here you go. And then you would take that and you'd eat it with your family. You'd eat it with your family. It would be a meal that was also holy, that also had everything to do with your relationship with God. Again, does this sound a little bit like communion? I mean, animal sacrifice is not something that we do. Uh, it's not something that takes place in most religions 
anymore at all, but, um, and it was never a part of Christianity. But as Christians, we did take this understanding of like making ourselves right with God, making ourselves right with each other, kind of we took that understanding into our table as well, into our understanding of communion, into Eucharist, into the Lord's Supper. We understand communion to be relational for sure. The communion liturgy includes the words, by your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. The liturgy of this table, the work and ritual of what happens at the table is, um, it's something else. It's just so deep. And it's deep because of a very shallow reason. It's deep because food is awesome, right? Food is awesome. Food is, can we just like take a moment to like be a little bit celebratory in our hearts for good meals? For the one dish that only grandma knows how to make, right? When you gather at at your best meals, maybe it's around a holiday, is there special plateware that you use? Were there traditions passed down? Is there the recipe that you finally got from your mother-in-law after years of trying? (laughs) Right? There's sacred and special things and it's so plain and yet it's so very deep. Have, Have you ever tried to share a meal with someone when there was contention between you? It's so difficult. The food tastes not as good if you're, even a, if you're even paying attention to it, right? We gather at tables together. We gather at tables to be with each other, to, to reconcile, to share stories, to share laughter, to share smiles, sometimes to share tears as we remember people together. And we gather at these tables to share food. It's so basic, and yet it's so deep. I mean, how many times have I taken communion without even having half of the enthusiasm that I have for my grandmother's potatoes, right? It's so basic, and yet it's so deep. For Christians, the table is a place where we can experience forgiveness, where we can experience God. And this table, it extends to all people. It extends to the people that I won't invite to my house for dinner because I have prejudgments, because I'm human. But Jesus invites everyone here. Those restaurants where when the homeless people walk in, they're immediately shoot out the front door. There's not space for you here. You're not invited here. They're invited here. Everyone's invited here. This is like a leveler, it's a common ground. You know, and, and if, we, if we allow the rhythm of our worship to extend outside, then we can begin to see all of our tables as these holy places where God is present and where reconciliation can take place. As I was doing my research for this sermon, I came across something interesting. Apparently, in England, during a time period known as the Oxford Movement, Uh, there was a rise in the interest of worship. So like Christians and churches and scholars, everyone was getting back into liturgy. Everyone was getting back into worship and how important worship was. And it was a time of revitalization. And it is not a coincidence that as the interest in worship went up, so did soup kitchens and food pantries for the poor that when people were back getting into the liturgy of God, more people were being fed. This is not a coincidence. Your spiritual nourishment and your physical nourishment go hand in hand. The table is both. On our altar today, we we have food, and all of this food came from within the walls of this church. This is the food for kids bucket. Uh, serving two different schools, one in the county, one in the city, for kids that are on assisted meal programs, 
when they go home on the weekends, they don't always have food. So they're, they're given bags with something to take home so that they can have a snack. Um, so some of this is that. Some of this comes from uh, donations that will go to Circle of Concerned Food Pantry down in Valley Park. Let's see, we've got bridge bread. We know about bridge bread, right? It's what we use for our communion bread. They sell this out there. This program has helped people um, get jobs and get them off the streets and make bread for a living. It's also really tasty, so that's helpful. And then I had to put this out because I'm a child of this church. This is, this is apple butter. I remember them pulling out the big vats to make apple butter. I don't remember a time when I don't remember them pulling out the big vats to make apple butter at this church, a way that people have come together in fellowship. On Wednesday nights, we share meals before we have our education time. If it was the summer, the young adults work with One for the Crow plant space, we could have fresh produce covering the altar as well. How many ways has our ministry extended to the table even when our hearts were unable to? Right? I think that, um, I think that we often feel estranged from one another for good reason. That we don't remember our very basic connections and that it's something like the table that can bring us back there. When commenting on the Oxford movement, Charles Cook said that there was a deep connection between worship and a starving world. That should tell us something. If we want to be equipped for the task ahead, liturgical practice is where it begins. Communion is the ultimate leveler, where status and opinion fade away. For those who are in relationship, and those who are yet to be in relationship, including those who are estranged from each other. In the ways that we are estranged from one another, in the ways that I am estranged from some of the people that will eat this food, some of the judgments that I have about the people that made it, that shipped it, that canned it, that sell it, that prepare it, that eat it, in the ways that I am estranged from them, the table reconciles us if we just remember that it belonged to God in the first place, that all of the tables belong to God. I think that even when there are contentious issues and opinions between them, I think that food will still bind us together. That one family member you don't get along with, it's easier over pie, is it not? It's easier over pie. And I think through food, God finds a way to bind us together. I do. It amazes me that Jesus is able to reach us in the most simple ways. We don't need some ornate temple with a sacrificial system to fulfill the law of God. Jesus taught us that to fulfill the law of God, all we needed was a meal, some water, which is good because inevitably I'll be sitting at a table sometime this week and someone will say to me, hey pastor, I have a question for you. What do you think about, how do you feel about, what is your official stance on? And I can respond. Well first, I'm glad we're sharing this table together. Let's start right there, okay? Let's start right there. Amen.